Okay, today we're talking about evolution of brain and behavior. Uh, this is chapter six. We are in week six. Uh, one of these days I will accelerate a little bit. I'll do two chapters in one week, but that's not this week. It's uh, going to be sometime in the future. Uh, okay, evolution of the brain and behavior. Modern scientists see the study of change of life over the ages due to natural uh, selection and sexual selection as beneficial to understanding humanity for more than just its current snapshot view. This can be done through DNA analysis, where scientists compare the DNA of one species with the DNA of, of another. For example, we know that the DNA of chimpanzees only differs from human DNA by 1.6% which means that 98.4% of uh, chimpanzee DNA is identical to, to humans. Does that mean that humans can breed with uh, chimpanzees? The answer is no. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they looked at all the great apes, and all the great apes uh, have 48 chromosomes, uh, whereas humans only have 46. Now, what they think happened was, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, great ape uh, chromosome structure, uh, they have two small uh, chromosomes that they think uh, fused together and made the uh, 40, 46th chromosome uh, and dropped us down to 46 chromosomes. And that's why humans are different from chimpanzees. So what would happen if a human had sex with a chimpanzee? or a gorilla, or a orangutan, what would happen? Well, the, the answer is nothing. Uh, they would not be able to uh, reproduce. Uh, they, would be, they wouldn't be viable because of that missing chromosome uh, in the, on the human DNA, uh, the, uh, the uh, offspring, there would be no offspring. The egg and the uh, sperm would not be able to get together. And to reproduce. It's one of the reasons why if, if humans have sex with, with uh, other animals that, uh, that uh, they don't produce uh, some strange uh, animal structure. It just doesn't work that way. It can't work that way, as, as a matter of fact. Humans have to uh, reproduce with other humans, uh, and if they try to reproduce with another species, uh, nothing happens. <laughs> uh, Okay, and there we go. A chimpanzee, common chimpanzee, and the pygmy chimpanzee. Another name for the pygmy chimpanzee is the bonobo. Uh, humans are the closest to the bonobo, as weird as that may seem. Scientists have been toying with the idea of evolution for a couple of centuries before Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace published their findings in 1858. This isn't a new idea, but there's a reason why uh, it took them so long to publish it, why it took them so long uh, to, get the, to get the word out. And the answer is because uh, religion was blocking the path. Uh, religion uh, looks at, uh, doesn't look at science. Uh, it doesn't accept science. It doesn't always accept science. Uh, it accepts science to, today more than it has in the past. Uh, but it was science that seemed to be blocking everyone. As a matter of fact, Darwin was very, a very religious man. And he held, actually held on to his, uh, uh, his uh, theories and his uh, writings for over 30 years. And the only reason that he published is because he heard that uh, Alfred Russell Wallace was about to, to uh, publish. And, uh, and because of that, he, he hurried up and published because he was, he was a relatively old man at the time. Um, and uh, he, he wanted to be the first. And, of course, we don't talk about Alfred Russell Wallace. We just talk about Charles Darwin. People pick on Charles Darwin all the time. In 1859, Darwin published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. <clears throat> Darwin made three main observations in his book. Individuals have a given species... Uh, Individuals of a given species are not identical. Uh, so if we see two male cardinals outside, uh, then the probability is that those two cardinals, there will be a difference between the two. Uh, humans, of course, we don't, certainly don't all look alike. 
Uh, we certainly don't act alike. Um, culture changes the way that we uh, interpret the world. Uh, so individuals of a given species are not identical. That's obvious. Some of the variation is inheritable. Uh, so if you have, um, my family has bad teeth, <laughs> unfortunately, as sad as that may be. Uh, and unfortunately, it, uh, my mother was the first uh, let's see. My mother was the first person to die in her family uh, with any of her teeth intact. All the other members of her family, her grandmother, her great-grandmother, uh, her mother, of course, uh, they all died with, uh, with false teeth. And the reason they had false teeth is, is because uh, their teeth were, were, were bad. As, uh, just to show you how bad uh, our teeth are, uh, when I was born, I, uh, I, I already had bad teeth. As soon as my teeth grew in, uh, they, they discovered that they weren't any, they weren't good and they needed to pull them. So when I was three years old, I had all my teeth pulled as weird as that sounds. Now, of course, these were baby teeth. Wasn't that big a deal. Uh, but for the first, um, from third grade until I was uh, nine or 10 years old, I had false teeth. Um, as strange, I, it, it's, it must seem really weird for a, a, a child, a, an infant, not an infant, but a small child to have false teeth, but I had false teeth. And I used to chew on them all the time. I used to chew on my false teeth, and I actually chewed a pair up, and my mother got mad at me because they had to make another pair. <laughs> they had to buy another, another, and she was mad at me for, for her whole life because I chewed up my false teeth. As strange as that may seem. Not all uh, offspring survive, and I'm sure I was one that she, my mother, wished that I had not been the one to, to have survived. But uh, all of her, all of her babies uh, survived, so I guess uh, we were, we were a lucky family. Darwin would later uh, add a fourth corollary, that of sexual selection. Sexual selection states that each sex ex exerts selective pressures on the other in terms of both anatomical and behavioral features that favor reproductive success. Hence the strange anatomical features of some creatures, such as uh, you can see a cardinal uh, flying toward you uh, from a mile away. They are so bright red. Uh, the mandrel, of course, has uh, the mandrel is the uh, uh, is a one of the great is the great ape that you're looking at uh, on the right side there. Uh, he has such bright features. Peacock, I, if, I don't know if you've ever been around peacocks, but peacocks are about as functional, uh, they're barely functional at all. Their tails are so massive. Peahens are the ugliest things you ever saw, but uh, peacocks, the males, are, are quite, uh, quite audacious. Uh, so here we have three, and these are all males. All three of these are males. Uh, the the red cardinal the the peacock with the, the peacock with a uh, with a large tail it the its mate is the pea hen and then the mandrel of course uh, and the more outlandish they look uh, the more likely they are to reproduce so the question is do humans have uh, do are, do we have sexual selection at the same time do do we participate in sexual selection. And the answer is we do things to ourselves to make ourselves more attractive. And, of course, these, these women uh, uh, have uh, expanded their upper lip. Uh, they, found, they found that to be attractive. Uh, the, this is a woman from China a uh, 100 years ago. Uh, Chinese women would bind their feet to make them small and dainty. Uh, for two reasons. Uh, one reason was so that they would take uh, short choppy steps and that would keep them from uh, uh, damaging their hymen so that uh, people would know that they were virgins because their hymen was intact. And the other reason was because they, they thought that it was more beautiful uh, for uh, Chinese women to have tiny feet. And of course, they're not very functional. Uh, obviously, they're not very functional because if she has to do any heavy work, then she's, she really can't do it with those feet. Uh, and, and this is a very painful process, too, by the way. Um, these, uh, there were, 
there were select uh, indigenous people of the Americas uh, that would uh, shape their heads. Uh, this is from, uh, the, on the left you have uh, drawings of Lewis and Clark showing uh, a group of individuals that they refer to as flatheads. And of course, if you know anything about the, uh, the Northwest, there's a reservation up there called the Flathead Reservation. It has the Salish, the Kootenai, and the Coeur d'Alene on it. Uh, those individuals actually uh, do, don't do this. Uh, I'm, not I'm not sure why. Um, maybe they did when Lewis and Clark were there, of course. Uh, but they don't do it anymore. Uh, if you go down to South America, uh, nobody does this down in South America now, but uh, they have skulls uh, of individuals that uh, had uh, had their heads shaped uh, in various shapes. It's very, very weird. Very, very different. Sexual selection. Um, it made them look intelligent. It made them look attractive. Uh, only people with with cone heads uh, were able to get married. Only people with small feet were able to get married. Only women with that uh, lovely plate in their mouth were able to get married. Uh, of course, let's not leave the Europeans out. Uh, Europeans have done some, some goofy, goofy things uh, to make themselves more attractive. Uh, this is a corset. Um, it was the De Reguerre. Uh, back in the uh, in the 19th century, certainly uh, into the 20th century, women wanted to have the smallest waist they possibly could. It gave them that uh, classic hourglass shape. Um, what what is what's ha actually happening here is uh, the corset is pushing all the organs up. Uh, it's pushing them up and it's actually pushing them down to some extent. Uh, all the intestines are, are are down below the the crease. And uh, their, her liver and her stomach uh, and her heart and her lungs, of course, are up above. But as you can see, it's very constricting and it's something that uh, it's no, hardly any different from that, except it's around her waist. Scarification is another, uh, another way of attracting, um, attracting a mate. In some cultures, it's considered uh, attractive. Uh, this is kind of an interesting picture because the guy on the right is an adult Cherokee uh, in Oklahoma, and the guy on the left is an adult uh, pygmy from Africa. Uh, why they, how they got together, is kind of an interesting. That's that's Oklahoma, actually Oklahoma there. Uh, the pygmy has come to Oklahoma. And it's showing the difference between a uh, an indigenous indigenous person of Africa and, and an indigenous person of the Americas. Uh, tattooing is another is another way of uh, of attracting a mate. Sexual selection. Uh, the more tattoos and the more uh, intricate the design, I guess, uh, the more attractive they are. A lot of people tattooing these days, tattooing arms. I was in the, I was in the commissary uh, a couple days ago, and there was this lady in there, uh, and she had on, well, I won't tell you what she had on. She had on some fairly tight clothes, uh, but her whole shoulder was, uh, one shoulder <laughs> was bare. Uh, she had a strap on the other side, of course. Uh, but And she didn't have anything on her right side, but her whole left side was, was tattooed. It was, it was kind of odd. I'm not, I, it was really difficult to, to understand why she would do it. Uh, it was on her back and it was on her shoulder. It wasn't on her face or anything, but it was, uh, it was on her shoulder. And it was quite extensive. There was a great deal of, of tattooing that had taken place. And, of course, I, I noticed, and my wife got mad because I noticed. Anyway. <clears throat> okay, there you go. Extended ears, earlobes that go down to your down to your shoulders. You can see a, an European here. This is the European. These, are, these two ladies are very happy with their extended earlobes. Uh, I have a nephew that uh, kept putting loops in his ears. Not loops. Um, well, anyway, he, ex he ex extended his uh, earlobes 
uh, until they were almost that big. And then he just stopped. And when he stopped, they, they grew back. The whole healed up and, and the, his uh, earlobes just kind of kind of shrunk. Uh, these are the uh, mountain women of Thailand. Uh, and as you can see, they have uh, rings on their legs and they have rings on their neck. And, and the reason uh, they do this is to, uh, is to make themselves more beautiful. Uh, the more rings they have, uh, they used to wear their wealth on their neck, but they don't do that anymore. These are brass rings instead of gold rings, of course. Um, okay, yeah, that makes them more attractive, obviously. Obviously. And these are the Watusi of uh, the Kalahari Desert. Uh, and uh, the higher they can jump, the... Uh, uh, more attractive they are to, to women. Uh, if we are looking at this picture, these guys, these are the guys and these are the women over here. And in this picture, these are the guys and these are the women over here watching them jump. It's kind of like watching an athletic contest to see who can jump the highest. As you can see, they, well, yeah, they, they pull up one leg when they, when they jump. But the idea is to, to, to jump the highest. As you can see, this guy has a headdress on, so you can't tell how high he actually jumps. Uh, I was going to look up what, the, what they call these guys. These, these are males. Uh, and as you can see, in this culture, uh, they paint themselves and they wear outland, not outlandish as far as they're concerned, of course, uh, but they they paint themselves, uh, and the eyes are really important in this culture, as strange as that is. These are, are uh, individuals that live on the Sahara Desert in Africa. And uh, the idea is that uh, the more control you have, uh, the more attractive you are. And as you can see, this guy is moving his eyes independently of one another. And that is something that they're looking for. They are also looking for the big smile, uh, but it, uh, it has to do with the the eyes. And like I said, these guys, these are males. They're they're the males of the tribe. Uh, the females uh, do don't do this. They don't paint themselves up or wear uh, brightly colored clothes. Not like the men do anyway. Uh, so these are the males. And of course. Uh, Piercings are always fun. As you can see, this guy's all pierced up. I'm, it's a lady, actually, if I'm not mistaken. And there we go, another lady. With lots and lots of piercings. Yeah. Anyway, sexual selection. Do we do it uh, as humans? And the answer is, well, we yes, we do. Sexual selection. Understanding the phylogeny of species allows us to study the behavioral and neural adaptations that allowed animals to exploit particular ecological niches. Comparative studies may focus on specific differences between closely related species or may be concerned with general principles across larger uh, numbers of species, but in each case, the use of an evolutionary framework provides additional explanatory power. And uh, this is the classification, uh, classification of bees, canaries, Norway rats, of course, chim common chimpanzee, the bonobo, the human, and the gorilla. Princip principles of neural function revealed by comparative anatomy studies may often be generalized to many species, including humans. What do we look at? We look, we look at the brain. The major divisions of the brain are varied by all vertebrates. Uh, brain differences between species of vertebrates uh, can often be directly related to their ecology and behavioral complexity. So the more complex you are, the more complex you are, uh, the more complex you, the society that you live in, the larger your brain has to be. Uh, the more controlled that you are, um, the more that you do every, the same thing everybody else does, you don't have to think, so your brain capacity can be smaller. Such differences tend to be quantitative in nature, relative size of brain regions or the size of the neurons, 
is a good example. The field of uh, classifying, and we're going to talk more about this uh, in just a minute. Uh, the field of classifying animals is known as taxonomy. Taxonomy is an ongoing endeavor. Taxonomy can be done in many ways, including uh, through paleontology, studying of fossil remains. We can compare animal DNA with human DNA. Uh, we can put paleontological uh, information with DNA analysis in a study called convergent, convergent evolution. So we're not only look at, uh, looking at what we look like right now, but we're, looking, we're trying to see what we look like in the past so that we can compare our former selves with our current selves. Two of the fastest swimmers in the ocean are tuna and dolphins, each evolved for efficient swimming, and so there are similarities in their structure. However, the dolphin is a mammal and the tuna is a fish. Similar features due to convergent evolution is called homo homoplasy, uh, similar development. And of course, as you can see, their tails don't even point the same direction. Uh, the uh, <sighs> Sorry, I was yawning. The, the, tuna, <laughs> the tuna has a uh, vertical uh, tail and the, the dolphin has a horizontal tail. Homology, a uh, study of similarities, looks at similarities between uh, body structures of animals with common ancestry. A good example of homology is the forelimb of several mammals. Uh, outwardly, they seem so different, but the structure is very similar. Analogy refers to two structures that have similar function. And of course, we're talking about humans, dogs, seals, and bats. Even though the structure of the, the hand is, is about the same, uh, the bat, of course, flies with his, the, the, the uh, seal swims with, with his, uh, the dog runs on his toes on a constant basis, and humans, of course, are, are, can write with their hands. Classification of species begins in general terms and runs to more and more specific. Kingdom is the most general term. Living creatures are broken into five kingdoms. Uh, animalia, which is what we are. Plantae, which is plants. Fungi, which are, are funguses. Uh, Monera, which is, uh, has, deals with bacteria. And then protista is uh, single-cell animals. Now you might say that uh, the bacteria are also single-cell uh, animals. Uh, but it is a different uh, type type of uh, cell uh, that these ha are, these individuals have as single cells. The main subdivision of a kingdom is a phylum. Uh, three phyla uh, are Chordata, Mollusca, and Anthropoda. Uh, we as humans are Chordata. The main subdivision of a phylum is class. Some classes within the phylum Chordata. Uh, mammalia, aves, and reptilia, that's mammals, birds, and reptiles. Uh, the main subdivision of a class is an order. Uh, some orders within the class mammalia, carnivora, herbivora, and primates. And we as humans are primates. Uh, herbivora eat uh, vegetable matter almost exclusively, and carnivora eat meat almost exclusively. The main subdivision of, an, of the order is the family, such as Canidae and Thalidae. Uh, the main subdivision of a family is the genus, such as Canis and Vulpus. Uh, Canidae and Thalidae are both are dogs and cats. Canidae is dogs and Thalidae is cats. Uh, Canis and Vulpus, uh, dog and, and fox. Uh, the main subdivision of the genus is the species such as Canis familiaris and Canis familiaris are your dom domesticated dogs. While Darwin's theory was widely accepted, no one really knew or understood how change took place until biologist Hugo de Vries. Working with primroses, de Vries proved that sudden changes were caused spontaneously by mutations, and that's uh, how we came to have 
a seedless uh, ruby red grapefruit. It was a mutation. Genetic studies subsequently demonstrated that chromosomes provided the building blocks of inheritance. Later, genes were identified as the building blocks of chromosomes. Watson and Crick demonstrated that DNA was arranged in a double helix made up of nucle nucleic acid. Today, the Modern Genome Project gives us an ever-expanding view of the makeup of humans as compared to other creatures. And it's really kind of exciting. That's how we know that chimpanzees have 98.4% uh, uh, identical DNA to humans. That's how we know that, that uh, Neander Neanderthal uh, DNA exists in modern humans as well. Researchers have determined that species who have, have to hunt for their food, such as humans and carnivores, have bigger brains than animals who don't have to search for their food, such as ungulates. And ungulates, of course, are the uh, are deer, uh, antelope, uh, any, anybody in that range. But as humans, of course, we have to hunt for our food. That doesn't mean that uh, we're going to, our evolution is going to change because we can go down to the corner drugstore and buy ourselves a hamburger, uh, it just means that uh, we are hunters. We have been hunters in our evolutionary past as well. We just don't have to do it as much today. The more novel the means of obtaining food, the larger the forebrain of the animal. Magpies have been known to dig up potatoes. Uh, that's a magpie on the bottom there. Uh, house sparrows have been, picking, have been seen picking insects from car radiator grills. Uh, that is a house sp sparrow in the middle. And crows have been known to drop rock-hard palm nuts in front of cars that run over them and open them. And, of course, this, this is a crow. Birds who store food will have larger hippocampus, hippocampi than birds who don't. The hippocampus is necessary for memory. Thus, a larger one is needed for those species that rely on memory for survival. The acorn woodpecker, that's the acorn woodpecker right there. Clark's nutcracker, uh, that's the nutcracker right there. And this is a chickadee, a black-capped chickadee. These all store their, uh, their food, and therefore they have larger, they have better memories. The differences between the brains of humans and the brains of other mammals are mostly quantitative. Rats and humans are similar in in that each has a brain that represents about 2% of the to their total body weight. The basic differences have mostly to do with the size of the cerebrum of the human and the prominent increases in surface due to the gyri and sulci. And I'm going to show you a human brain as compared to a rat brain. There you go. As you can see, the human brain is much more extensive than the uh, rat brain. Uh, they still uh, occupy about 2% of our body mass. Whether you're a rat or you're a human, it's about 2% of your body mass. Rats don't miss out completely. They uh, have a much larger olfactory bulb than humans and so have a much stronger sense of smell. So they operate on smell more, far more than they operate on uh, on any, any of the other senses, including eyesight. The nervous system of vertebrates uh, have large, have several sim uh, similarities. Uh, they develop from a hollow dorsal neural tube. Uh, they show bilateral symmetry. In other words, there are two of er just about everything, except for the pineal gland, which is, there's only one of those. Uh, but you have two hemispheres of your brain, and each, each uh, side is symmetrical. Segmentation is present. Uh, pairs of spinal nerves extend uh, from each level of the spinal cord. Uh, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous systems are separate. Localization is present. Certain functions are controlled by certain, loca by certain locations in the central nervous system. Anthropologists and comparative biologists assume that all vertebrates have these features in common because they descended from a common ancestor. Invertebrates are another story. There are 17 phyla to cover the invertebrates, while vertebrates 
are part of just one. It has been estimated that for every human on Earth, there are over one billion insects. That's a lot of insects. The basic plan, all vertebrates and most invertebrates, share a basic plan that consists of a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. Whether you're a bug or whether you're a human, you, you have uh, a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. <clears throat> the brain, all vertebrates and many invertebrates, including mollusks and insects, have brains. The general evolutionary trend in both vertebrates and invertebrates is toward increasing brain control over ganglia at the lower levels of the body. Axons of mammalian's, uh, mammalian's neurons are surrounded by myelin, which helps them conduct impulses faster. Invertebrates have no myelin to speed nerve conduction. If we look at present creatures and their fossilized ancestors, we can see that the brain has changed over time, whether it's a bird's brain or a hominid brain. Making a cast of the inside of the skull to map the brain is referred to as an endocast. And as you can see, these are, uh, these are uh, endocasts. Well, they're probably just skulls. Anyway, <clears throat> there you go. Uh, and these are all the proto-humans, Neanderthal man, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, uh, Afarensis, uh, Robustus, uh, the gorilla, the modern gorilla, and the more modern chimpanzee. And as you can see from this chart, the Neanderthal man has the largest brain of all hominids that have ever existed. And here we we may have the small medullas, tree shrew, lemur, and rhesus monkey all have bigger uh, medullas, but we certainly have a much larger neocortex. And that is the end of the chapter. Okay, I'll see you guys next week.